Hello, welcome to all the virtual audiences from around the world. In this session, we are going to talk about personalized experiences and how Stitch Fix is delivering these experiences to their customers around the globe. My name is Madhu Nunna. I'm a solutions architect here at AWS. And with me today is Vujbal Sarin. He is a data platform engineer at Stitch Fix. Before I talk about personalization and specific solutions, I want to spend a minute talking about how AWS is helping the retail industry today. We help in increasing the customer insights for retail customers with services such as personalized and forecast. And we also help in optimizing the operations across multiple business domains with services such as IoT and cloud migration. By doing this, we help in transform the way these customers engage with their end customers and also supply chain partners across multiple business domains, be it fulfillment uh, or e-commerce. These are just a few of several ways AWS is helping the customers realize and accelerate their business goals. So why should you personalize? Because everybody's tastes, preferences, and needs are different. Personalization is crucial to make sure you are optimizing customers' lifetime value. So how does personalization help? It helps customers in choosing the products and services they need. This becomes obvious when you go to Amazon.com or Stitch Fix that we'll take a closer look at later on in this presentation. And by doing this, you can help improve customer engagement with your online content on your websites, on the mobile apps, or any other dynamic content you're trying to deliver to your customers. If you have customers who have a sense of being taken care of, then that directly translates to increased purchases, increased subscriptions, more application downloads, and also any other content that you're trying to deliver as well. And all of these things directly contribute to an increase in your top line. So while the benefits of personalization seem obvious, what is not obvious is the best path to unlock those benefits. So let's take a look at the personalization journey at amazon.com and the lessons we learned from there. Before you take a look at specific personalization solutions, it is important to take a look at your current state. Where are your data sources for personalization? What is your data life cycle? What is the process you do or you use for data transformation? How do you implement data integrity? And what is the timeliness or what is the latency of that personalization? Can you deliver personalization or rather can you deliver maximum value to your customers by delivering, by personalizing their online real-time experiences or offline experiences or maybe both? And how about continuous learning from your customer behavior? How do you ensure that the personalization you are building for your customers is dynamic and is keeping up with the changing behavior of your customers. How can you and can you leverage technologies such as machine learning to accomplish this? To summarize, if you understand your current state, it will make it easy to select the right approach for personalization that satisfies all your business needs. At AWS, broadly speaking, we see two different approaches to personalization. Looking at the left side here, organizations with little to no machine learning experience make use of services such as Amazon Personalize, Amazon Neptune, and Amazon Pinpoint. Amazon Personalize is a service using which 
developers can build applications using the same machine learning technology used at amazon.com to build personalized recommendations. And Amazon Pinpoint is a inbound and outbound, highly scalable and flexible marketing communications service. Amazon Neptune is a managed graph database. Using Amazon Neptune, you can build identity graphs for personalization and recommendations. Using a highly scalable graph database like Amazon Neptune for identity graphs makes it easy to link identifiers with the user profiles and also easily query at a very low latency. By doing all of these things, uh, you can do ad attribution, ad targeting, analytics, and also personalization. Now, looking at the right side of this slide, organizations with mature machine learning expertise, they focus on building custom personalizations. And these end up becoming IP-backed core differentiators for them. Stitch Fix is one such organization, which we'll look at later on. If you look at AWS, AWS has the broadest and deepest set of machine learning capabilities and the supporting cloud infrastructure thereby putting machine learning in the hands of every developer, every data scientist, and other expert practitioners. Amazon SageMaker is a fully managed service that helps developers and data scientists in building, training, and deploying machine learning models at scale. It makes it easy and simplifies every step of the machine learning workflow thereby making it easy for you to build machine learning use cases, whether it is for predictive maintenance, uh, computer vision, or capturing or predicting customer behavior for personalization and recommendations. Amazon DynamoDB is a uh, key value document database, and it helps in providing ultra low latency serverless data store for storing your user profiles, user events, clicks, and any other customer behavior related data. Similarly, Amazon uh, Aurora serverless, which is a relational database option for doing uh, for similar data store uh, that can serve some of your other use cases. You can also use in-memory cache, elastic cache, for low latency data reads. And if you need uh, microsecond uh, latency for your uh, DynamoDB access, uh, you can use DynamoDB Accelerator. You can also use Amazon CloudFront, which is a fast content delivery network to securely deliver your personalized experiences to your users around the globe at low latency and high transfer rates. Optionally, you can also use Global Accelerator, which is a networking service uh, using which you can direct your users traffic through AWS own global network infrastructure, thereby optimizing your customers' performance by up to 60%. Amazon Route 53 is a DNS service that uh, helps you in directing user traffic around the globe through various flexible routing policies, thereby enabling you to build low latency and highly fault tolerant architectures for personalization. The key takeaway here is, as an organization, no matter where you are in your journey, in your machine learning journey, AWS provides you multiple ways to personalize just like Amazon.com. So now that you have chosen the tools for personalization and also the right cloud infrastructure, how do you ensure your design and your architecture is optimal and is in line with your business goals? AWS well-architected framework will help you in doing that. Uh, using this framework, you can learn the best way, best architectural practices to build and operate highly secure, highly reliable, and cost-efficient architectures and solutions on top of AWS. 
It also provides the best ways to improve your solution, continuously improve your designs as well. Not only that, AWS also provides a self-service tool, AWS well-architected tool available on our console that you can use to accomplish the same tasks. With that, I hand over to Vichwal Sareen, uh, who is going to talk about Stitch Fix and also the personalizations they are building there. Thank you. Uj. Hi, I'm Uj from Stitch Fix, and I'm a data platform engineer uh, working on our algorithms side. So at Stitch Fix, we are using data to deliver personalized styling and clothing recommendations for our users. So the goal of the service is to provide our users the best possible clothing uh, that fits their life and their uh, preferences. So how does data work at Stitch Fix? We have a few different ways of collecting data from our users. So some, uh, in some cases, we are taking direct input from our users. For instance, they could be liking or unliking uh, particular styles or types of clothes, and we use that to feed into a style profile. The other th aspects of our business could potentially be using uh, preferences uh, from the pieces of clothing that have been kept or returned back to the service. So for instance, when we ship a box of clothes, which we call a fix, the items that have been kept, they become sort of part of your style profile. And the items that have been returned we use them as signal for the things that a user may not want. That could be from a fit perspective or a style perspective or some local uh, preferences in terms of where they live or what their lifestyle or their profession is. So we use those features to build a unified style profile for our users. So there's some business context around it. So what we want to do is we want to take these ratings that a user is generating and collect them both in real time and in a historical context to generate and serve recommendations for our users. So um, some of a more practical aspects of this is that we want to be able to serve our historical and recent data in about like 80 milliseconds of a, P, a P99 of about 80 milliseconds. Our traffic has been growing and we want our um, backend infrastructure to be able to horizontally scale as our data grows. We also want, since we operate in a few different geographies, we have to be able to deal with data compliance issues, things like GDPR or local privacy perspectives. For instance, a user may ask us to delete the data and we want to be able to delete the entire style profile or the data that we have been collecting from the user. Yet, we also want to have like low operational and cost overhead. So as you can see, like um, this is a lot of different requirements on how we can respond and serve recommendations, yet keeping our operational um, and serve our business context. So what we had before for storing these ratings and preferences from our users, we had about 120 node Redis cluster. So what we were doing was we were collecting these ratings and preferences and storing it essentially in a hot memory tier. So the problem we faced with that was as our data was growing, we had to continuously keep adding more nodes and there was a complexity from an operational perspective of constantly rebalancing and growing our cluster. Also, Redis stores data internally within um, as strings. So the cost is pretty high for capturing and storing this data. And also since Elastic Cache and uh, AKA Redis is um, um, memory backed, our disaster recovery story wasn't as robust as we would have liked it. Because if we had a catastrophic failure on our Redis cluster, we would lose this very valuable user data, which we were using to serve re recommendations, both in a batch and a real-time context. So 
to sum up, what we wanted to do was we want to be able to serve about, let's say, about 3,000 of these ratings for our clients in about a context of about like P99 of 80 milliseconds. All the data is usually keyed by client ID. As far as like data recency goes, we want to be able to serve recommendations in like about a second since a user took an action. So for instance, if a user liked a particular piece of clothing, we want to be able to use that rating in about a second after it was generated by the user. We also want to have fault tolerance and recoverability in case there, is, there are node failures or there is a catastrophic event, we want to be able to rehydrate this data with low or very little effort. Of course, there's a notion of like scalability and cost where when we were running our Redis cluster, it was about $1,000 a day and we wanted to s reduce that cost because the traffic has been growing steadily and that cost was also growing. So to implement um, a different backend to store and serve these recommendations, we came up with like a high level methodology on how we would be testing different Amazon services to benchmark against what we are trying to do. So what we did was we built a little harness which would simulate the live traffic that would have some level of seasonality of how our users are accessing and writing to this data store. It would have basically a test harness, which was also measuring the latency, the error rates, and throughput. So with that, we could basically swap these data backends and then have an ability to benchmark different strategies or implementations. So, um, what we did was we came up with like some key uh, metrics or characteristics for which we wanted to build our solution. So the first one was we want the backend, the data backend to be able to scale as our traffic grows. We wanted high read and write performance. We wanted to be cost effective. We want data recoverability uh, against disasters. And we also wanted to have good developer semantics or ergonomics to use this data store. So we had the existing implementation with Redis on Elastic Cache using sorted sets. And because the data was in memory, the performance was very high. And we were getting item potence because we were using the sorted set semantic. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Redis stores the strings, uh, the, the objects as strings. So it has a high overhead. So we tried using protocol buffers, compressed protocol buffers. So that reduced um, the memory footprint and we were able to reduce our cluster size, thus making adding some cost and operational gains there. However, um, we still had the issue of recoverability and we lost the set depend semantic. So with Redis, um, we have high performance, we were able to make it cost effective, yet we didn't have the scaling characteristics and the recoverability characteristics that we wanted. We also experimented with Aurora serverless using the JSONB um, column type. So since it's Aurora serverless, which is disk back, it had nice scaling performance uh, characteristics. However, when it came to performance, it lacked because we were often hotspotting um, so yes, it was cost effective and there's recoverability because it's disk back, but the performance suffered. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the final solution, which is what we ended up with, which was like a tiered DynamoDB implementation, which met both our scaling, operational, performance, and cost uh, characteristics. So this is a little bit of a high level diagram of our architecture, what we ended up with. So what we did here was we built a multi-table data structure, uh, data strategy. Um, there was a table for our historical data. 
there was intraday and a real time table. So let me talk a little bit about why th we chose three tables and what was the write and read paths to it. The historical table was data that was older than a day and went back to the start of time. For us, it's about six years ago. And the, the right path to that was through an e Spark job that ran, runs on our EMR cluster every night. So the, the strategy there is we take a client's historical data and then we compress it into a unified blob and we, writ, we write one key per client. So um, the goal there is to use the put item semantics and to use the get item semantics to get the historical history for a client. So as I mentioned earlier about, we stored about 3,000 responses per client. So that roughly translated to about 20 kilobyte payload. And so per client, there was a compressed JSON payload of about 20 kilobytes. The intraday and the real time table, they were, uh, they had a row per event, which is every time an event was generated, it was keyed by client ID and the timestamp. So the goal there was to have a stream from our message bus, which happens to be Kafka, and to read the events from the message bus and to write rows into the intraday table. The, the recency of that table is from about a minute ago to about a day. And the real time table had a similar schema. However, it was coming from a direct HTTP endpoint generated from a client action. And the recency of the data was from now to about two minutes ago. So how did the read path tie these three tables together? So when we requested a user's data or a client's history, what we did was we have three concurrent requests that go to these tables independently. And we then have circuit breakers that are running for each of those requests. And then once those requests return, we merge those results, dedupe them, and we return a unified result back. So what that does is that we have three separate read paths, however, coming together in a single request. So the writes, to, to repeat myself again, the writes are happening from either from Kafka, Spark, or direct HTTP writes. And on the read side, we're taking the data from these tables and either stitching them together through get item or uh, direct queries on these tables. So the end result was that we were able to get about our P99 latency in about 60 to 80 millisecond range. And for since we were using individual circuit breakers, what that guaranteed was that if any one of those queries or getting data from the historical table was outside that limit, we would still have some data to serve, even if we didn't have all the data. It is also possible that a user may not have had historical uh, data and it just, just had recent data. In that case, we would just serve data out of the recent and the intraday, the real time and the intraday table. So the key takeaways for us were that we um, really tried to first understand our data read and write patterns. That is what led us to build the simulation and to be able to test a few different data backends. Um, we swapped our data backend from using a hot Elastic Ash Redis cluster to using a tiered DynamoDB solution. However, for our users and our internal APIs, we did not change any of the API characteristics. The API and the protocol stayed exactly the same, just the underlying implementation had changed. What was also very useful for us was to constantly leverage the the depth of knowledge that the AWS support team and the Dynamo TB, DB team brought to the table. They were really instrumental in helping us carve this sort of this horizontal and vertical schema tables and bringing them together.
Thank you, Virj. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, working with you during your design and building up this solution. And thank you very much for all the audiences, virtual audiences from around the world. If you want to explore more about what AWS is doing uh, for retail or consumer goods customers, you can go to the URL we are showing on the slide here. Also, if you want to explore more and maybe dive deep into some of the services like Amazon SageMaker, Amazon Personalize, uh, or DynamoDB, or any of the other services we touched upon in this presentation, uh, please go and explore those tracks in this reInvent. With that, I thank you all for attending today and uh, have a great day.